let's talk a little bit about what is mindfulness. To look at that, I want everybody to think about a peak experience, okay? Everybody pick out, you know, maybe you're walking down the beach and there's a gorgeous sunset, okay? Maybe you're surfing, perfect wave, or skiing. Maybe, I don't know, does anybody, you know, if you have children or nieces or nephews holding a little baby the first time in your hands, looking down, that kind of peak experience. Maybe you're at Yosemite, there's Half Dome, just gorgeous. Okay, everybody get a peak experience. Got one? Okay. So, um, we want to think about what makes that special. Um, and compare that to day-to-day -day life. In our day-to-day -day life, we're going to wake up the first thing in the morning, and a lot of times we'll think, I wish the alarm wasn't going off now. <laughs> just, just five more minutes, right? <laughs> I'm running into traffic. Oh, do I have to go to this class? Oh, man, I have so much homework. Why can't my friend be different? Or my, or my boyfriend or girlfriend? There's this constant stream of evaluating and, ju and judging the present moment wishing that this or that were a little different. And then how many ways can the present moment be right now? Not a second from now, right now. How many ways? That way. One way, right? The way it is. But there's this constant stream wishing this or that were different. So what if we took your peak experience? If your peak experience was that beautiful beach walk and you're going down the beach, if we took that peak experience and put that same mindset to it and said, it would be kind of like, oh, it's okay with the sunset, but I wish there was more purple over there, more pink in the cloud color, then it would be really okay. Or you'd have that newborn baby and say, eh, not that cute. Or uh, you go to Half Dome and say, can anybody afford a whole dome? Half Dome, what's this? You know, come on. You know, there, there's that, that, that voice if you overlaid it. So really, Think about that peak experience. I can almost guarantee you there was somebody at that same beach that was not having a peak experience. They might have been having a miserable day because of what was going on in their mind. And there's other times when somebody else is having a peak experience, you're at that same place, you're not having a peak experience. Or you go back to the same beach, it just wasn't the same. So the question is, how can we increase the amount of mindfulness into the day? And what is mindfulness? So what is mindfulness? Um, so it's this moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness. And I want to do another, um, another kind of experiential exercise that will let you guys really get a sense, you're wondering what I'm grabbing up behind here, that will get, get a sense of what is mindfulness, an experiential way, because it's kind of like riding a bike. I want you to really get this. So I want you to just grab one raisin and then pass it back. Grab one raisin. And I'm going to set this up for you. Grab a raisin and pass it back, please. Grab one. Don't eat it yet. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how to use this raisin. Um, and if you ask why I brought raisins, because watermelons were a little too heavy, <laughs> would have worked. But I, we, we, I, raisins were a little bit more convenient for me. And um, what we're going to do, now I started off early. Earlier I started off and I said that you guys are cavemen and cave women, right? Okay, I'm changing, never mind that. You guys are now aliens from a different planet far, far away. Very advanced, much more advanced than human civilization. You got it? So you're aliens and you're so advanced that um, you don't talk anymore. You can just telepathically communicate. And they want you to explore Earth and find as much as you can about Earth and telepathically communicate what's going on. Because you, can, you know, if I said in words, um, you know, I, I, I'd like you to describe the color blue. You haven't seen the color blue. You really couldn't do it. But if I could give you that experience from my mind, that's what these guys, that, that's what you're able to do. So it's, it's pretty cool. And you're going to come across this little, this little, okay, I think there, maybe I'll grab one of these over here, this little brownish kind of thing. And what I want you to do is your job is not to, um, is, is not to describe it. I don't want you to describe it. I just want you to experience it really deeply so you can give this experience to, to your, your, your other planet. This, your planet really is depending on you for this, this raisin, okay? So I want you to close your eyes and put it up to your nose and take a deep whiff in. I'm not describing the fragrance in words, just really, just really appreciating it. See if you can get all the subtlety of the fragrance. And then maybe just take the raisin, don't put it in your mouth, just feel what it feels like if you rub it across your lower lip. 
So you can just feel your lower lip and then feel your upper lip. Okay. And in a little bit I'm going to have you, not yet, but you're going to take the raisin into your mouth. So pay attention to what part of your body, what part of your mouth takes the raisin in. Just leave it in your mouth for a second, don't show yet. Move it around and feel the texture. And you're going to take one bite and then move it around. See if you see any, feel any juice release. Move around, different parts of your mouth. Maybe one more bite. Then not describing it, just seeing if you feel the juice release and feel the intensity of the taste. Not describing it, not comparing it to another raising, not thinking better or worse. Slowly see if as you chew, you get that juice just to release and squeeze out. Move it around a little bit. And even when you swallow a little bit, what, what does it take to swallow? Feel the, feel the muscles that it takes to swallow. Okay. Okay, and I think some of you are finishing up, so I'll just... Um, now, now, now that is how you usually eat a raisin, right? Usually that's what you do? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, so what was that like? Was that somebody? Was it, was it, did you, who, who liked it more than your average raisin? Okay. So it wasn't a special raisin, I have to tell you. But there was a quality that you brought to tasting the raisin where you're fully involved, fully engaged, as opposed to just describing the raisin. You had this moment to moment. You weren't judging it. You were just fully tasting it, feeling the fragrance. Um, so when we're not mindful, we're, doing, we're judging the present, often negatively. We're, uh, when we're mindful, we're having more of a non-judgmental awareness. Now, it's not bad to judge things. Sometimes you have to say, oh, that milk smells bad. I better not drink it. <laughs> right? You need your judgment. But really, all the time, Sometimes you want to just really get involved in the moment. Uh, not mindful, just kind of wish, always wishing the present were different. Well, why does it have to be this way, complaining, as opposed to embracing what's going on right now, is be mindfulness. Not mindful, you know, more of the same. Hey, another day. This day is just kind of like the last day, just a little bit different. As opposed, when you're mindful, this, there's this curious, interested quality to your attention. What some people call beginner's mind. And when you're not mindful, there's a sensation of automatic pilot. You're just, um, you're just um, not paying attention to what you're doing. So is anybody, um, you're, you're, you're maybe going from one place in your car to another, maybe work to home, and you think, you know what, I'm going to stop by the drugstore on the way home. And you don't. Because you just drove automatically, thinking about something totally different, not paying attention to what you're doing. That's automatic pilot. And we spend a lot of our life like that, as opposed to when we're mindful, we're fully engaged and present. So how can we be more mindful? Well, the first thing I'm going to practice, have you do something that's really easy, because it's short, and it's being mindful of one breath. Um, I like to show people the difference uh, between diaphragmatic and non-diaphragmatic breathing. Of course, the diaphragm is the muscle between the chest and the abdomen. So when a muscle that's domed contracts, it flattens out. So if it flattens out, then um, what has to happen? Your abdomen has to, you can't just get taller, right, when it flattens out. That'd be cool, but you can't, because you have a spine. Um, but, uh, yeah, wouldn't that be neat? But um, what has to is your abdomen comes out, because the organs have to go somewhere. So I'm going to ask all of you which looks more relaxed, breathing, with my diaphragm or breathing with the accessory muscles. So first I'm going to let my abdomen expand. This is way number one. Way number two. Okay, this time I'm not going to let my abdomen expand. I'm going to keep it in like this. Ready? Number two. So I'm using the other muscles. Okay, who votes the way number two is more relaxed? Nobody? Okay. Number one, let's see some hands, yay. Okay. So let's go ahead and just feel what it feels like to feel a breath. 
So I'm going to have your hand in your, on your abdomen. And I'm going to have you feel yourself breathe in and have your abdomen expand. Just one breath. Feel your breath go. And your chest can expand too, but I want your abdomen to go out. Ready? Feel your breath go in. Your abdomen go out. And back. So just paying attention to one breath at a time. Feeling the in-breath. And the out breath. And you might see that even with a couple breaths, your kind of adrenaline level comes down a little bit when you're fully paying attention to and just enjoying one full breath and one in breath. It's easy because it's just a very short period of time. So now's the um, important part of the talk where I'm going to go over the explicit instructions of increasing your mindfulness in your life. Okay, I want you to note all these steps. The first step is you need to patiently focus your attention on present moment sensation. It can be the breath. It can be a raisin and really tasting it, smelling it. It can be walking and just maybe feeling, with each step, feeling the ground on your feet. It can be feeling the sun, just really fully enjoying scenery. Listening to music, listening to one note at a time and enjoying it. So you're going to patiently refocus your attention when your attention wanders to a present moment sensation. Okay, really pay attention to step number two would be to patiently refocus your attention to a present moment sensation. Three. Okay then. Um, that's it. The thing is you do it again and again. You gently bring yourself back. The most important thing is this patience. Stuff, not giving yourself a hard time. Bring yourself back again and again and again to the present moment. The problem with mindfulness is that people, and the people, people have problems, is they use the wrong yardstick. What do I mean by that? Let's say if I were to ask you, would you know, could, would you, um, I wanted you to measure the width of a dime, okay? Would you use your car odometer? Probably not, it wouldn't work so well, right? You need to have the right units of measurements, the right way of measuring. So people say, well, I'm going to be mindful. I couldn't do it. I, couldn't, I tried it for 20 minutes. I couldn't stay focused. Duh. That's because that's not the way our brains work, right? So with mindfulness, the correct unit of measurement is one breath. Feeling one breath, one footstep, one bite of food, what's happening right now? And then if your attention wanders, again, that whole thing, patiently bring it back. If it wanders 100 times in 100 seconds, you just keep bringing it back every time, 100 times. So remember the, um, the thing where the stress level goes higher and higher and higher. Every time you have a little episode of mindfulness, it brings that stress level down. So, and it has a residual effect. After you took the deep breath for a little while longer, you probably felt a little bit more relaxed. So, um, even if you increase, you know, a lot of times people start looking at mindfulness and they realize, wow, look at how much of the time I'm not mindful. They start realizing that. And the idea is, if you, even if you increase the amount of mindfulness from 1% of the time to 2% of the time, that's going to double your stress reduction, even though it doesn't sound like a lot. If it wasn't for these mindfulness episodes, it would have built up way higher in the stress level. Let me talk about when, when stress is really an issue. You are not mindful. You have a physical sensation. A common physical sensation, let's say, is your heart racing. When you're, when you're stressed out, right? Your heart's racing. Boom, 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 boom. And a um, common thing, I don't like my heart racing. I wish this would go away. Why does it have to race like that? What do you think happens to the heart rate? Faster. Boom, 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 boom. It's going even faster. I hate this. What's going on? Boom, 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 boom. Faster and faster. And what, there's a, that's one vicious cycle. You're wishing the physical sensation away. Then let's say you blame the physical sensation on, um, on something else going on. It's because my math teacher. I don't have to have this math teacher, she's really hard on me, or, you know, you know can't my friend get along? Or you're, you're, you're wishing something about the present moment were different. Now, maybe you could change things. Maybe you could change a math class later, or talk to your friend, or give your friend feedback. But right now, the only way things can be is as, as they are, right? So you want to, so, so that, um, that's just making that same 
physical sensation, the heart racing worse. Here's another thing that happens. I'm thinking, oh, I wish my friend was different. Oh, I wish my heart would slow down. This is awful. And then what I might do down here is I might start um, biting my nails. I might go for a cigarette. I might, um, I might you know, do some other habit. might yell at somebody. I might go check my Instagram 20 times, even though I just checked it a second ago and I really didn't need to check it, even though I have homework. I might go through some habitual behavior. Um, is that because people you know, really thoughtfully think, you know what I could use right now, what would really be good for me right now is biting my fingernails down to the cuticles would be, that'd be excellent. That'd be so helpful for me. A cigarette. Wow, that would be good for my health. I think, I think I'll have a cigarette. No, that's, that's not what happens. Why does that happen? What happens is your mind is so preoccupied, right, of wishing this and that were different. You're not paying attention to what's going on. You're just stressed out. The stress level's building, and your body does what it, what it does to, um, that it's learned to, 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 for temporarily to reduce the stress. Well, biting the nails temporarily, I feel a little better, but you know, 10 seconds later, I'm not better. So it's not a healthy long-term behavior, but it works in the short term. So what else can we do? And just looking at some of the things I said, you know, substance abuse, biting nails, overeating, overuse of, of technology, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever, when you know that you have something else you need to be doing. If you think, if your heart racing is part of your problems, I tell people, you know, check your pulse, and if it's between, you know, 50 and 100 beats per minute at rest, it's not really irregular, um, you're not having a bad, you know, significant chest pain or shortness of breath, it's probably just the stress, right? And we want to know about as doctors if it jumps up to 150 beats a minute just sitting down. Of course, you exercise, you get it up to that, but it shouldn't do that just sitting down. So that's a way, if somebody's worried about their pulse, that's a quick, easy thing you can do to, to reduce the stress a little bit. But let's talk about the alternative, more mindful way of dealing with the stress. You have the heart racing, a physical sensation. We know, let's take some diaphragmatic breaths and just, you know, cool, I'm just going to let my heart beat as fast as it wants to go. Just let it go, heart, go. Go. What happens to the heart rate? What do you think? Go ahead, heart, go. What was fueling the heart rate from going faster and faster was that resistance. So you say, oh, okay, diaphragmatic breaths, go do, do your thing, heart. Ooh, starts going down. And then you say, um, you know what, I know, you know my boss you know, or, or my teacher, I wish I were different, you know, well, maybe I can give them feedback later, but right now they can only be as they can be, so you know, I'm just gonna let that thought go. And then you no longer have that vicious cycle. You have time to thoughtfully respond as opposed to act habitually. Anybody here um, like roller coasters? Anybody? Yeah. Magic Mountain, Disney, what do you think? All those places? Okay. So um, a lot of us uh, like the, you know, like, like roller coasters sometimes, but the beginning of the ride. You know the beginning of the ride? You're going up the top of the first hill and you're going up higher and higher and higher and you're thinking your heart's racing, your palms are sweaty, you're thinking how did I ever let Charlene talk me into doing this? <laughs> you're up at the top of the, the, the top of that hill and you go and you look down and you know you're gonna die. <laughs> but then what happens, you're going up, down, side to side, up and down, side to side, and you start having fun. What happened? Huh? What, think about what your body, your, your heart's still racing, your pupils are still dilated, but now you're having fun. And now it's you stress, you're excited, you're enthusiastic. So um, everybody right now, I'm gonna, this half the, it's you stress, so this half of the audience gets to say the word, first syllable, this half gets to say the second syllable on your cue, okay? Ready? And one, two, three. You. Sounded to me a little bit like use stress. Hmm, right? Um, that's a good way to think about it. Because what makes stress worse is you wish it away. But one, you know, sometimes you might sit there and meditate and listen to relaxing music, but sometimes you're stressed, you have that adrenaline flowing. You say, oh, you know, great, I have a lot of adrenaline. I can use that energy. You can go for a run, you can go dance. Or you can even just say, you know, I'm, instead of resisting, okay, I have a lot of adrenaline, I'm gonna feel it course through my body, all right. Course through my veins. 
And that's another way to deal with stress as opposed to resisting it. So briefly, now we're going to talk about some applications of mindfulness, but briefly you want to use the right yardstick, this breath, don't resist the stress, you don't have to, and the other thing is you can use it, you don't have to believe all your thoughts, and you don't resist your thoughts, you don't say, oh, if only I got a clear mind, then things would be okay. So those are some of the things about mindfulness. Mm -hmm.